ought to get you going this morning, man, if nothing else does. Good morning. Great to see you out at New Hope today. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you are a guest, it's your first time with us, uh, what, what an honor it is for us to have you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, if it's your second or third time back, but you've never filled out one of those communication cards, we would love for all of our guests to do that. Uh, they're in the pew in front of you. We promise we're not going to beat on your door. We're not going to call you on the phone. But through the mail, we're going to send you information that tells you about New Hope Church, about the staff, our ministries, the various service, uh, services that we have, hopefully answer most of your questions. Those cards are also for our church family to get information to the staff, prayer requests, praise items, uh, appointments. Uh, please, write on there, put them in the offering when it comes by, and we'll get to those uh, usually on Tuesday morning, as quick as we possibly can. Uh, ushers in the back, I am missing a clipboard. So if you can find the missing clipboard and bring it to me, that is always very, very helpful. Um, let me take care of a few announcements and then some updates on prayer requests, and we will get engaged in our worship today. Um, several of you already saw the email, all right, that went out this week from Pastor Mark because you responded. Uh, there's a full table out there of socks and shoes, but also there is an insert in your bulletin. Take the opportunity to read it. There is a church in Calway. It's called Calway United Methodist Church. Some of you are familiar with it. We have attempted uh, to come alongside them and encourage them over the last couple of years. We've held services with them. Uh, we've provided some resources for them. Uh, and Jeff, oh, there they are. Jeff, Jeff and Cindy, stand up real quick. All right? Just names and faces. Uh, they have a ministry that works with gang members, all right, uh, individually and couples, and they do uh, some pretty hardcore marriage counseling out of, out of that part of our community that is very challenging to reach. And uh, they have been looking for a place that they could, could get. Folks who've been involved in gang activity don't usually want to come this far. Uh, you're going to hate what I'm going to say. They don't really want to come and hang out with you guys. <laughs> you kind of scare them a bit, okay? And, and, and so uh, they like to stay a little closer to their own neighborhood. And so they've been looking for a place. And when they shared it with me, I remembered, wow, this might be a way to revitalize that church, which is really invisible in its community and has been for a, a decade or more. And so uh, what a lot of you don't know is Jeff and Cindy, when they leave this service, they get in their car and they drive all the way down to Calway and they share in a service with about 9 to 13 people, all right, and they've been doing that for a year now, building a relationship with the folks who were there, working with the uh, powers that be, and they've now got to a point where they're ready they to kind of start to launch some things in that community, and one of the directions that they have responded to is uh, in order to become seen again in the community, they probably should go to the closest elementary school to the church. Introduce themselves and let them know they are there to be used. They are there to be a help. And they did that, and very quickly they got a call back. School just started, and kids can't go to school without shoes. And yet, hundreds of kids showed up at that elementary school without shoes. And so they said, here's a way that your church can help, is we need shoes. Well, Calway United Methodist Church only have about nine to 13 people in it. So we're going to help them. This is not New Hope, not going to get any credit for this, except in God's accounting, okay? Uh, this is going to be done through Jeff and Cindy and the new work. It's going to be called Calway Community Church, I think, in time, all right? And so this is going to be the influence of that church in that neighborhood to make a difference, and that's part of what we're here for, all right? So if you didn't get the email, uh, read the insert. You can bring the socks or the shoes, kid sizes, all right? Uh, bring them next Sunday. Drop them off at the table. They'll be in the pavilion. And uh, that would be absolutely terrific. I'm going to be excited with uh, what's going to happen as we begin to plant seeds in that direction. Uh, right after the third service, at about 12.15, we are going to have a church-wide business meeting. I hope many of you have the opportunity to go have something to eat and that you'll come back, all right, at about 12.15. We hope to keep this to 30 to 45 minutes, all right? Uh, let, let me tell you what we're going to talk about. We've got some really important things that we need to share with you uh, on a church-wide basis. Um, two years ago, uh, we recommended to you that Mark Addis and Chris Bishop, uh, who are part of our pastoral staff, be licensed as, as ministers. 
and that's usually a one or two year thing and then it's the next step to ordination we are bringing both of those names to you as a church to approve their ordination that we are going to ordain them as ministers of the gospel as they work here at New Hope Church we also have seven names to recommend to you for our deacons commission here at New Hope we have revitalized this over the last several months a couple of our elder board members have worked very, very hard to get this thing to where it is right now, and we are excited with where it's going to go in the fall. If I call your name and you are in this service, would you please stand and remain standing until I ask you to be seated? Maureen Steinbach, Judy Woodley, Jennifer Wiest, Barbara English, Tiffany Jones, Tony Wiest, and Jerry Hayes. Jerry? Thank you. All right, I knew. I know that. All right. So these are three of the seven that are being recommended today to serve on our deacon commission. And uh, there's a ballot, all their names on it. Uh, you can check yes or no, all right, by each of their names. So if you want them to serve you this coming year, come and check yes. All right. Thank you, ladies. You may be seated. And I know this third item is just going to draw all of you back to the uh, business meeting this afternoon. We have four bylaw changes to recommend to you. Doesn't that sound titillating? All right. Um, churches have to have bylaws, all right. The state of California requires it of how we function. These all pertain to our deacons commission. Um, in our bylaws, it refers to deacons and deaconesses. That word deaconess is really a tough one to say a lot, all right? Uh, it's not found in the Bible, actually, the word deaconess. Uh, it's something that, that somebody in humanity created. And so what we're doing is eliminating that term from uh, our, our, our bylaws, all right? And there were also some distinctions. If the, the, the guy deacons met separately from the girl deaconesses, then they each had their own chairman and co-chairman. And, and, and so we're eliminating that. They are one commission working together to serve our church, and they're all deacons, okay? And that, that, that's a very biblical term. So that's what all the bylaw stuff is. So there's four of them. It just pertains to very, very small things. We're then going to uh, review our remodel project and give you an update both on what was done and the expenses that have been paid. Uh, we have one proposal to add to that remodel project, but it's not part of the sanctuary, it is part of the bridge building, and that is the bathrooms are in dire need of remodel work, uh, so we're asking permission to spend uh, building funds in this remodel project to finish out those bathrooms as well. They get used a lot by people in the sanctuary when those are busy, uh, and also for weddings and funerals, those get, get used an, an, an awful lot. Uh, we'll show you what the balance will be after that expenditure is paid out, and then the last thing is to chat with you briefly about the next step in our, our buildings around here. Uh, we've talked about it for years, and we said after the remodel, we would get very serious about uh, an office reception building. Get rid of the triple wide uh, trailers that our offices are in and build a building that will house our offices and a facility where four to 500 of us can gather for receptions and events and take care of uh, funerals a little bit better than we do now. So, hey, Tim. Yo, yes. Could you move your pack to a different location? Could I move my pack? You mean this, this thing right here? Uh, yeah, it's picking up a lot of static. Which, which location would you like me to move it to? Well, I was hoping you had a front t-shirt, a front pocket, but it doesn't look like you have a pocket up there. Just, the other hip pocket or the front shirt just, pocket? No, no just, just, just move it somewhere else. Change pockets. Careful. I have a cousin giving me advice up here. <laughs> uh, okay, what well, this other clipboard is, so we'll probably only get down one side. There are volunteer signups. Um, many of you have already volunteered for this. We're looking for some new uh, people who might join our existing uh, team. Uh, as you know, we do a lot of memorial services here, and often there are receptions connected to those. And so we have to call people on very short notice who can come and help set up or come and clean up afterwards and or serve. So men or women, if you can help in that area, please put your name and your contact information on here. Also, there are the sign-ups for Grief Share, which is going to be starting this coming week on Tuesday and Wednesday, if you'd like to be part of that Bible study, or our Tuesday or Wednesday women's Bible study. So several things on this clipboard. Be sure you sign up on the right one. 
they're going to get started on this side, and if I get the other clipboard, I will get it going down this side. Uh, men's breakfast on September the 9th. Jeff is going to be our speaker along with some friends I think he's going to be bringing. And uh, so we certainly would love to have you men out for that at 8 o'clock on September the 9th. Uh, men's Thursday and Tuesday night Bible studies are kicking off in September. Uh, men's new study on Thursdays, though we're still meeting, but a brand new study starting on the 7th, and a men's Tuesday night Bible study will kick off again starting on the 12th. Uh, parents of kids in elementary school, JAMS session will begin September the 13th, so please take note of that. Uh, financial peace will start on Boy, the fall, it's just like going back to school. Everything gets geared up. So there's lots of things that are going to be happening. And we have a need for a fifth and sixth grade teachers. All right? Uh, Sunday school at 1045 every other month. All right? So six months out of the year. Uh, some people say, I've never taught Sunday school before. There is a first time for everything. All right? Uh, give it a whirl and see if it's your niche. Contact Jennifer and she will follow up with you. Uh, we've got the other clipboard, so Mark's going to start it right there on that end. All right, so we've got them going down both sides. Thank you, Mark. Great job. Uh, let me highlight a few prayer requests. Um, Brandy, uh, her grandmother and mother in our 8 o'clock service, she was back in Boston, had eye surgery on a cancerous tumor behind our eye. She will lose her complete vision in that eye. Uh, this is pretty serious stuff, and uh, it'll, we, we won't know for another week what the impact of, of last week's surgery is going to be. Please be praying for her recovery. Um, Marianne Levin Dusky, she's part of our 1045 service. Um, her daughter-in-law teaches Sunday school for us. She's got five or six grandkids that are part of our Sunday school. Uh, she was just diagnosed this week with stage 4 cancer. She has a very large tumor in her abdomen and a couple of very small tumors also in her abdomen. Uh, the big one is the one causing the problem right now. They cannot remove it until they shrink it some. It's too large to remove. So um, the doctor is very optimistic. Number one, she is healthy. Number two, what's amazing is these tumors have not yet attached themselves or invaded any of her internal organs yet. And so that is very, very positive news. Um, I expect to see her uh, in the next service, but would appreciate you remembering to pray for her as they go through these early stages and early steps of, of what's next with her treatment. So just a few of the updates that we wanted to bring to your attention today. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offerings, and then we'll get engaged in our worship. We've kind of been spoiled the last three weeks, haven't we? Kepler's been here all three weeks, all right? And uh, so it's been good, Tim. It's been good. So um, would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, thank you for the life that you share with us. Thank you that you are very faithful and consistent, that you never take a day off, you never take an hour off, you never take a moment off from us. I wished I could say the same was true about us towards you. I do know that there were moments this past week that uh, I kind of acted as if you needed the day off. I either failed to think about you and seek your wisdom for some actions or decisions. And Father, it was obvious. You see, you don't want to be just the God of the big moments. You want to be the God of all moments. You just don't want to be our strength when we are weak. You want to be the strong one even in the area of our strengths. Sometimes we get the idea that, oh, this is something I can handle, so um, I don't need to bother you with it. And yet, God, you are bothered most when we don't bother you with everything in our life. And so, Father, I am so grateful that you are patient with us as we learn these things. I am grateful that uh, your loving kindness is very evident, that uh, you, don't, you don't look for moments so that you can slap us down. But, Father, you teach us in those moments. And so, Lord, thank you also for your generous spirit of forgiveness that when we discover we have been um, willful or we have played the Lone Ranger, that, um, that you are very gracious to show us the error of our ways and so gracious to be there the next time as you were there the previous time. Father, thank you for um, your presence when we face tragedy, calamity, uncertainty. Um, 
bad news. It's so quick for us to wonder where you are when the news is bad, and it's so easy for us to forget where you are when the news is good. And yet you were there for all of it. So, Father, I trust that there'll be, a growing, there'll be growing steps in each of our lives in the days and the weeks ahead as we learn to be more fully dependent upon you. Thank you for sharing with us your ways, your will, and your wisdom. We be submissive to all of them. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing today. We commit all this to you in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Um, if you've been here the last several weeks in our study for the book of Habakkuk, you know where to turn to for the book of Haggai. All right, until a few weeks ago, you might have had no idea where Habakkuk was in the Bible, but if you've been here, Haggai is just to the east of Habakkuk, all right? Uh, it's just to the right, a couple of pages. So if you want to turn there, that's where we're going to be reading from in just a few minutes with this new arrangement. I've got to get myself organized here. Um, I think we're good. The book, of, uh, the book of Habakkuk, the one that we just finished last week, was written about 620 B.C. Now just as a little reminder of your history in case you've forgotten, uh, B.C., before Christ, okay, and those dates ran in reverse. So the way the calendar went was 620 B.C., then the next year was 619, 618, 617. It counted down to one, and then it started 01 A.D., 02 A.D., okay, and that's how we ended up now where we are, 2017. So if you want to compute how many years it was since the book of Haggai was written. We know it's 2017. Add to that 620 years, and the book of Haggai was written 2,637 years ago. All right, does that work? I think my math is right. Um, I did well in math, didn't do so well in history. Um, or maybe it was the other way around. I forgot. It's been a long time since high school. But anyway, 620 B.C., and, and Habakkuk was written before the Israelites were taken into Babylonian captivity. If you'll recall, the book of Habakkuk was the warning. Because the people of Israel had been so rebellious against God for such a long period of time, God said, okay, I'm going to discipline my people, and I'm going to send their enemies to take them into captivity, and that was the Babylonians. That's where we were. That's what had transpired in the book that we were in. Now, we're going to be looking at the book of Haggai, and um, it's 538 B.C. Cyrus is now king of Persia. He is the one who allowed the Jews to return back home. So Habakkuk, before they were taken in captivity, Haggai, just a little bit after they returned. Zerubbabel was the new governor that was appointed by Cyrus. Isn't that a great name? Zerubbabel. The next, who's pregnant in our church right now? Anybody want to make an announcement? All right, your next son will be named Zerubbabel, all right? He was appointed the governor of Judah, and Joshua, a name we're pretty familiar with, all right? There have been multiple Joshuas. It's also the Hebrew name for Jesus. Joshua was the son of uh, Josedek. He provided spiritual guidance as the high priest at this time in, in Judah. About 50,000 Jews were allowed to return, and immediately they began to rebuild the temple of God, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians. They got on that right away. But very quickly, strong opposition rose up from outside the nation of Israel, as well as indifference by the Jews themselves. And it caused them to abandon the work before it was finished. Isn't it amazing how throughout history, not just in the past, but even relatively current history. How little it takes for the people of God to abandon the work of God. It doesn't take much to discourage us, and we're off on our own saying, oh well, must not work. Well, after 538 B.C., we pick up about 16 to 18 years later. It's now about 520 B.C., and this is when God called Haggai and Zechariah to challenge the people to return to the work in rebuilding the temple, the house of God. And he challenges them with a question that he asks four times, 
twice in chapter 1, twice in chapter 2. We'll look at those when we get there. He tells the people of Israel, I want you to think carefully. He says it this way, consider your ways. God is telling the people of Judah through Haggai, I want you to think seriously about the choices that you make because they have a consequence in your life. It's apparent that the people had quickly forgotten what the lesson of captivity was. They had already grown complacent with their newfound freedom and with their prosperity. The contrast for me is very startling between Habakkuk and Haggai. In Habakkuk, it was God's prophet who was initially angry at God for what the prophet believed was God's indifference towards them. But if you'll recall, by the end of that prayer in chapter 3, there was a turnaround in his perspective, and he realized, who our God is very patient with us. In Haggai, God is the one who initiates the conversation. Habakkuk, Habakkuk initiates it. In the book of Haggai, God initiates it. And God is speaking through his prophet about the people's indifference towards him. God is surprised, well, he's not surprised, but God challenges them at why so quickly after they had been given their freedom from what had been God's discipline over the nation's last rejection of God in their lives. Now, I want to set the tone for kind of what the theme of the book of Haggai is by you all looking at a few pictures that will be flashed on the screen. There is five or six pictures, and as you're looking at the pictures, I want you to think about what do these pictures all have in common? And there's a couple of, there's a couple of things they have in common. So, just watch. Am I in anybody's way? Okay. I was hoping that I'd gotten taller. I believe that's it. Oh, one more. All right, good. All right, so there are two things that you should notice that these pictures have in common. What's the first thing? Yeah, they're all churches. Absolutely correct. All right, what's the second thing you notice about all of them? Neglect, disrepair, abandon. You're absolutely correct. It's what all of those have in common. And that's exactly what the book of Habakkuk is all about. Aren't those pictures sad? Some of those structures at one time were magnificent cathedrals, while others were just small country churches. But in each case... Every one of them showed the signs of neglect and deterioration. Not only that, but there was a time when each had been filled with hope and faith and vibrancy. Those buildings had been prayed over and dedicated to the glory of God. They were passionate worship, and they had dreams of changing the world, but no longer. It often happens over time where the house of God, the temple, is neglected. At first, the signs are, are often very, very subtle, but they gain momentum as they continue to be neglected. All that is needed is for nature to take its course. And lo and behold, you have atrophy. Now hear me well, please. What is true of brick and mortar is true for the soul as well. All we need to do is develop an attitude of we'll just let nature take its course. And it will devastate us. Slowly but methodically, we begin to deteriorate and to erode. We never meant for it to happen. It wasn't our intent to drift so far away from the will of God in our lives, and yet that's where we find ourselves. There's been times when this house, this temple, has been filled with faith and hope. But occasions like I think we shared this morning where we worshiped fully. We dedicate ourselves to God's glory and to God's work in the world, but by assuming that things are just going to go well and, you know what, we'll put things on autopilot and cruise. Uh, folks, when we do that, we guarantee deterioration of the soul of God's house. Haggai speaks of the neglected temple of Jerusalem. He calls God's people to something better than what they're currently living with. He holds them accountable, and as a result, an incredible revival breaks out. Not a word we use very often anymore. It's kind of a word that's become a bit old-fashioned. 
Some of you probably in your 20s have no idea what a revival would even look like. It's been so long since you've had one or since you saw one. And for those of you in your younger years, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's my generation's fault. Now, if your kids don't see one, it'll be your fault. See, God has no grandchildren. God only has firstborns. Every single one of us, when we enter into a relationship with him, we become part of his firstborn children. My kids cannot have a vibrant relationship with God because I have one. I can't have one because my dad has one. Each generation must make those decisions, and that's what Haggai addresses here. Two times. Two times in the first chapter. The word of the Lord came saying to the people of Israel, consider your ways. He wanted them to consider the lack of engagement in regard to the temple and the lack of spiritual fervency in their personal lives. This challenge is as relevant today as it was 2,600 years ago. I want us to consider the life of Israel at this crucial time as it relates to us and as we think on the challenges that God brings to our attention to consider our ways. We're going to do this over the next several minutes by looking at the neglect of the people, secondly, the need of the people, and last of all, we're going to look at the newness of the people. All right? So that's what we're going to do today. Let me jump back into the neglect of the people. Number one, in verses, uh, verse two, we're going to notice how they neglected the times in which they were living in. Verse two says this, this is what the Lord Almighty says, these people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Keep in mind, they had only been back in Jerusalem for about 18 years, and for the last 16 years, there's been no productive work done on rebuilding the temple. They started right, they just didn't continue well. Does that sound familiar at all to you? Is there any familiarity with that scenario in life? We start well, but we don't continue consistently. The people were without a place to worship the God who had brought them home from their captivity. There seemed to be no urgency in their lives to get the house of God repaired and to get it ready for, for community worship. They felt as if the time had not yet come. I think it's rather clear that a lot of Christians today are neglecting the times in which we live in. There are a lot of believers who just cannot sense the urgency to be productive for God's kingdom. They only think about their own personal kingdom. Apparently they feel that there is a time coming, but it just isn't right now. There was a political ruler at the time of the Apostle Paul who had been confronted with the claims of Jesus Christ, and he said, I'm going to wait for a more convenient time. You know what? History does not record that a more convenient time ever came for him. The scripture says it this way, there is no better time than today. There's no more convenient time than now. It phrases it like this, today is the day of salvation. Now, not later, now is the accepted time. We can't regain time lost. We don't need to spend any time praying about whether we should be engaged in the service of the Lord. God is not pleased when we put off what we know to do for the next generation. The people neglected the time and the people also neglected the temple. That's also in verse 2. It wasn't the time for the Lord's house to be built. They weren't just neglecting the work of God, they neglected literally the house of God. There was no co uh, cooperative desire to see the house of God reestablished. Apparently there was no concern for a place for them to gather and worship. The one place that God had ordained to meet with them in Old Testament days was neglected and abandoned. It would be real easy for us right now, and maybe you've already started doing it. 
but it would be real easy for us to bog down right here in an argument about what the house of God is. That's an argument we could have. I don't really want us to bog down because, quite frankly, I don't think there's a separation in the three perspectives. You see, specifically in the book of Haggai, God is talking about two things. God is talking about the physical building called the temple. And he's also talking about the attitude of the hearts of his people who are the fellowship. It's, it's not one or the other. God deals with both of them here. We in, in New Testament times, because we are born A.D., all right, uh, we are born after the finished work of Jesus Christ, we have an added dimension to this. And that is Paul wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that this body of ours, this, this thing called Tim and called Shelley and called Mike and, 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 and called Maureen, we are walking temples of the living God. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the ascension of Christ back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came once again to invade the human soul of humanity. That, that, that's what it's called to be born again. That had not happened since Adam fell in the Garden of Eden where the Holy Spirit of God had come to live within the human spirit of man. It's what Jesus meant when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, not of physical birth, but of spiritual birth forgiveness of our sin by the death of Jesus Christ, now the life of Jesus Christ in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, once, once he has cleaned the vessel by forgiving us of our sin, he now comes to live within our human spirit again, to do in us and through us only what God can do. That's what it means to be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. And so now as we look at the context of this temple that needs to be rebuilt, what are we talking about? A facility, which are buildings. A fellowship, which is the people. Or well, the fleshly body, which is his real temple now on earth. We are to be walking, uh, uh, walking advertisements of deity wherever we go and whatever we're doing. In our work, in our play, in our relaxation, in our rest, in our recreation. We are to be walking advertisements of a living God who reigns in our hearts. I would suggest that it is dangerous to neglect any part of the house of God, whether it is the facility, the fellowship, or the fleshly body. I find also it's interesting that we start the study of Haggai on a day that we're having a church business meeting. And we're going to talk about the next step of construction of something here. If you're new to New Hope, you probably have no idea what the thought process of leadership at New Hope is about those kind of things. But we are a debt-free church. We do not practice debt because we want to be able to give to God's kingdom work. Our facilities need to be appropriate, but they don't need to be outlandish. We don't need to waste resources that could be used for advancement of his kingdom work. I find it also interesting, and maybe it's why God chose to wake me up at 12.55 a.m. this morning. See, I thought it was pretty cool coincidental that we're having a church business meeting to talk about that when we're going to preach on Haggai. All right, that way I'm assured of what your vote's going to be this afternoon. <laughs> but I find it also fascinating with what we're about to read in Scripture that at the same time that Shelley and I are moving. Let's, let, let me read. I should have done this a little, uh, a few minutes ago. I, I want to read the whole first chapter with you real quick. I should have done that before I started taking it apart. Let's just read the first chapter. Follow along with me. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, who's the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, if any of you are impressed that I know how to pronounce all those names, don't be. I just say them with authority. I have absolutely no idea if they're correct, all right? So, just, if you ever have a chance to read out loud, just say it with authority and Nobody else is probably going to question you about it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, wow. Let me pause right there. God says about the Israelites, these people. He didn't say my people. 
God's a little aggravated, isn't he? Have you ever said, these kids, when you're talking about your own children, <laughs> these kids of yours, as you point to your spouse, all right? This is God right here. These people, they say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. And then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? Two ways to define that phrase. Um, your decorated homes, your custom dwellings, while this house remains in ruin. You put more important, you see why this is time we're moving? Is, is, is You put more importance in where you live than you do my place of blessing. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. When it's bill-paying day, do you feel like you have a purse with holes in it? <laughs> this is what the Lord Almighty says for the second time. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build a house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I, I blew it away. And then God does what we rarely think he'll do. He says, why? <laughs> we like to ask God the why question, don't we? On this occasion, God asks us why. And it's not because he didn't know the answer. <laughs> he wanted to see if we knew the answer. So he says, why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you are busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains and the grain, the new wine, the oils, and whatever the ground produces on men, women, and cattle on the labor of your hands. What did we just finish before last winter? A drought. Some said it was because of global warming. I'm not so sure. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared, revered, were in awe of the Lord. And then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty. What's the next word? Their God. It's no longer these people because God is no longer that God. God is now their God, and he once again is their people on the 24th day of the sixth month, on the second year of Darius. All right, that's the context of what we're looking at. They neglected the time. They neglected the temple. We often ask our staff over the last couple of years here at New Hope as they're planning their next year's ministry outreach and they're working on their budget for next year to consider some things. We ask them to consider five, five thoughts as they create what they're doing. Is what we're going to do evangelistic is there a chance for people to know God we asked them is what they're going to do does it does it involve engagement how do we include people so they become engaged in what's going on we asked them is this something that will provide education for them or for their leadership that will make a difference in the way in which they reach out to others we ask is this going to be something that is edifying is it honoring to the Lord and is it building up of, of God's people and last of all does it provide expansion and opportunity to grow so I think as we consider Haggai's challenge here to the people of Israel that comes from the Lord whether we're looking at the temple of God, the house of God as a facility, we need to understand that this building called New Hope Church is the building where the fellowship meets. And this facility, we call it a church, but it's also a hospital where people who are sick in soul and spirit come to find healing and wholeness. It's also a home. For those you heard Tim Kepler stand up here a few minutes ago and say he used to live on the streets. This is now his home. 
church also the facility, a location, a building. As the church of God is also a beacon to the community. God's leadership in my life over the last 25 years has been to be available to any and all who come our direction with, with, with deep needs as a result of the loss of somebody in their life. And you know, we, we, we do a lot of funerals. Why? Because we are a beacon of hope in times of darkness to others. Celebrate Recovery got started here. Why? Because it is a beacon of hope to those who struggle with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Grief Share is a ministry of new hope. Why? Because men and women who have been challenged by the expected or unexpected death of somebody who they love so very, very much often leaves a gnawing hole in their life. And What's the answer? We have all various ministries, but all of them are designed for the purpose of, 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 of not Tim Rowland, of not Mark Addis, but God being a beacon of light through a place at a location where God's people meet. The fellowship is the gathering of God's people so we can grow, nurture, be supported, and encourage each other. It's a, it's a family staying connected. When we become disconnected, when we withdraw, it's when anger and bitterness and frustration festers and grows into something that's nasty and ugly. But when we stay connected, it's one of the reasons we talk so much about women's Bible studies and men's Bible studies and grief share and, 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 and celebrate recovery and small group ministries where we stay connected with each other. That's the fellowship. And then this fleshly body, the Holy Spirit of God living within us. What we need to do for one, we need to do for all three. Otherwise, neglect leads to abandonment. And, and the people in this period of time in verses 3 and 4 neglected the truth. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? The people were not invisible to God. He saw the lives they lived and the desires they possessed. They were unconcerned about his house, but they were diligent in obtaining their own homes and getting them to a standard in which they wanted. They failed to see the need for God amidst all of their newfound prosperity and property. They had lost their focus. God had not brought them out of bondage to simply grow them uh, uh, wealthy and prosperous, though he's not opposed to that. But he brought them out so that they might worship him and live for him. When we first got asked if we would like to sell our house because it wasn't for sale, Many of you have heard the story. Some of you haven't. We weren't looking to sell at the moment. Thought we'd wait five more years, and somebody asked if they could buy our house. I set a price that I thought was slightly ridiculous. Said it's not negotiable. And the reason it was non-negotiable for, I think, Shelly and I both is, is we keep looking for ways to give more, not to keep more. And so... If you can sell for one amount and buy for a lower amount, then guess what? Our monthly expenses are going to be reduced five or $600 a month. I plan on giving most of that away. I said, God, if this house gets in the way of giving, then I hope the sale doesn't go through. I'm, I'm not quite saying that right now because pretty much everything except a few pair of underwear and paper plates are in the garage. So um, I'm not sure I'm wanting to back out of this thing now, but it's been part of the prayer from the beginning. If this gets in the way of, of giving, then this ought not to be. And if there is a project we're going to do as a church family of building a building, if it gets in the way of giving, it ought not to be. If we take care of God's kingdom and God takes care of his people and that's what comes out of this passage but they were so, so consumed with themselves that they forgot about the expansion of God's work so they neglected the truth consider this what consumes the resources of your life most that's the question that God asked the people of Haggai's time I think it's a question that he asks us today 
what consumes the resources of your time, your thoughts, your finances, your work. We've looked at the neglect of the people. Let's look at the need of the people. Verses 5 through 11. God called them to consider their ways. He never points out a problem without offering a solution. He addressed their neglect, and now he addresses their need in verses 5 and 6. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. That's simple, isn't it? They were putting forth a lot of effort with little favorable results. God wanted them to take inventory of their lives. Were they really being productive? Was all that effort really bringing about rewards in their life? They labored, yet there was no satisfaction. They needed to conform to the ways of God. We spend too much time conforming to the ways of the world rather than to the will of God in our lives. We can put out all the effort we can muster, but if we have not conformed to the will of God, it's going to have little profit for us. God wants us to examine our lives and make the most of his glory. Are we sowing abundantly and reaping meagerly? Are we continually feeding the flesh and yet never finding contentment and satisfaction? Are we consumed with material gain and titles that it seems as if we are putting money in a purse that it just pours out the bottom of the bucket? I said purse and bucket, huh? Oh, well, that's all right. What of all that effort? Is, is it honoring and pleasing to God? Is any of it for him or is it all for self? You see, conformity to the will of God and not to the ways of the world is what brings peace, contentment, and satisfaction. There not only is a need to conform to the will of God, but there's a need to comply to the ways of God. Verse 7 and 8, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountain. Bring down timber. Build my house so I may take pleasure in it. God was saying the temple was in ruins and yet the mountains are filled with resources to rebuild it. God said, I've given you the resources to do it. Just bring them here and put them to use. We often make life much harder than it has to be. God has not asked us to perform some monumental task alone. He simply wants us to comply with his will. He has not changed. He supplied the resources for them to rebuild the temple then. He will supply the same resources for us to build his temple today. Whether it is the facility, whether it is the fellowship, or whether it is this own fleshly body that is the walking advertisement of God in our world. And then there is a need to confess. Verse 9, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Because of my house, which remains in ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. God's pretty straightforward with him, isn't he? You've got a problem, and he said you need to deal with the problem. Their abundant efforts had profited little. It may have looked on the surface, but in the end, there was little value. God asked a simple, profound question, Why? You see, God wanted them to understand their predicament and to admit it, to confess it. If, I, if you don't remember anything else I've said today, remember this next sentence, and I'm going to say it twice. God will not bless if we are unwilling to confess. God will not bless if we are unwilling to confess. Could it be that our lack is not just misfortune, but rather it's God trying to get our attention and turn us back towards him? When I say lack, I mean a lack of peace and rest and joy and peace and contentment and hope more than I mean money, savings, houses, and cars. And right, by the way, this is a great moment for another commercial. I've plugged CR. Uh, Mark, where are you? Mark, Mark, Mark. Okay, Mark's set up here. Mark, how come your wife is back there, three rows and off to the center? All right. No, <laughs> no fight today, right? Okay. Um, it's a good thing I knew they hadn't or I wouldn't have said that out loud, all right? Um, it, Mark's going to be leading, all right, uh, a, a financial peace university study, all right? It's in the bulletin, the starting date, the closing date. If you have never taken a biblically-based financial stewardship Bible study, you need to take this one. You need to take it. It is very, very good. All right. They also point out the need for concern. Verse 10 and 11, Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld dew and the earth has cropped. I called for a drought on everything. The situation in Jerusalem was not good. Their pride and unconcern is what led to drought and a lack of abundance. These trials were directed as a result of their disobedience. 
God wanted them to realize that he would not bless a rebellious, stubborn people. There was a genuine need for them to be concerned about the situation of their lives. At times, I wonder what it will take to get our attention today. Over my almost 40 years in ministry, I have seen that the church and the communities have lost a lot of influence. The world is getting farther and farther away from, unright from, from righteousness into unrighteousness. We have experienced unprecedented droughts and uncommon weather pattern. I don't think these things are coincidences. And I don't think a former vice president is all that's right. The world has rejected God. And God will bring judgment. I would suggest to you today that global warming might be far more of a spiritual problem than an environmental or political one. And just in case you've forgotten this, global warming is the method that God has chosen to ultimately destroy this world. In case you have forgotten that, God said, I will not destroy this world by a flood ever again, but the next time I will destroy it with a fervent heat. I will even destroy the elements thereof. So just know, you will not ultimately stop global warming except through repentance that's biblical let me wrap this up the newness of the people is found in verses 12 through 15 the message from God brought about a change in their lives it ought to change us as well notice this they were submissive Zerubbabel son of Shelatil, Joshua the high priest and the whole remnant obeyed the voice of the Lord and the message of the prophet because the Lord had sent them and the people feared the Lord and the people what? Obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai. This is what Habakkuk never got to see. Habakkuk when he wrote his minor prophet he preached the same message to the people but they didn't respond and you know what people would say about him today he failed as a pastor Habakkuk didn't fail he preached the message that God gave him to preach the people failed because they did not respond to the message revival broke out in Haggai the politician his heart got stirred the pastor, his heart got stirred. The people, their heart got stirred. And they obeyed God, all of them. And revival broke out. Things changed. You know what they would say about Haggai? He was a successful pastor. They preached the same message. The response is what's different. They showed yet faith that we talked about last week. They yielded to God. They were submissive. They also found out when they're submissive that they become supported because God said... I am with you. God says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be with us. They were submissive. They were supported. They were stirred. More than anything today, we need the stirring of God in our life. We need, Tim, Tim called us out, I think, a couple of weeks ago. We need the, the activity of God to be at work in our lives. Are you tired and weary of seeking your own success? What did God call you to his family for? To be great at a career, to be great at retirement, to be great with wealth? Nothing wrong with any of those. As long with each and every one of them, you honor God with them. And what's wrong with all of those? It's when, when you have that and you choose not to honor God, you're never satisfied. Verse 14b says, They came and began the work on the house of the Lord, the Almighty God. They were sincere. They didn't just confess their past. They changed their ways in the future. You see, getting in touch and in tune with God will change our life. God will take a life that was once unconcerned and complacent, and he'll make it sincere and productive. I pray that God will do a work in our hearts here at New Hope and we will continue to be, if we've not already been, we will start to be sincere in our efforts towards him. I want to get personal for the last 60 seconds. Have you been considering your ways for the last 30 minutes? Has God been very pointed with you 
about something that you need to address because you find yourself more like the people in Haggai's time than you do when revival broke out? Has God spoken to your heart about an issue, a matter, an activity? If he has, then I want to ask you today in our closing prayer to submit to him, yield to him, admit, as we said, confess, so that God can bless. And, and, and maybe there's a few of you in here who you, you're very aware that you can't serve the Lord because you've never believed in him for your own personal relationship with him. It's no accident you're here today. So why not call on him? No fancy prayer, no formula. You don't even have to come forward publicly and kneel and pray. But in the quietness of your heart, you need to say, Lord, I need you in my life. I don't want to do family life, professional life, financial life, church life on my own anymore. I admit I've been pretty selfish. Come live in my life. Do a work in me that only you can do. And I'll be amazed at what you do. Let's pray. Father, I'm, I continue to marvel how you take verses that were written thousands of years ago and when we get past the hard names and some of the peculiar expressions we discover people 3,000 years ago are not any different than we are today but God you continue to persist with us you continue to be patient with us you continue to be passionate about us and you continue to reach out to us so that we will enter willfully into a relationship with you. It, no, no work on our part, just a choice. A choice to be submissive. A choice to yield our life to yours. Thank you for hearing the prayers all around the sanctuary today. And Father, give us wisdom to know how not to become complacent about your house whether it's the facilities or the fellowship or this body of flesh. May we recognize the value that you've placed in each. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.